Good evening and welcome all to this uh, annual A.N. Smith uh, Memorial Lecture, which over the years has become the premier, the premier public lecture in Australia on journalism and issues confronting the media. And nowadays those issues are formidable and challenging. We meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present. My, my name is Michael Gawenda and I am the director of the Centre for Advanced Journalism. The centre opened this year and its mission is to improve the practice of journalism. It's a big challenge. The centre has a number of research projects underway, including uh, a nearly completed piece of research on the way the media covered the Victorian bushfires. Uh, we have other uh, research projects underway. We have started our public lecture program, which started with the former Prime Minister, John Howard. Uh, we will have uh, more public lectures over the next 12 months. The centre is situated within the Faculty of Arts. Uh, and works closely with the Media and Communications Program in the School of Culture and Communications. This program offers a distinctive blend of academic study and media-related practice delivered by internationally recognised scholars and experienced in industry professional, professionals. It is a great school. Now, Arthur Norman Smith was an outstanding Australian journalist, best known for his political reporting. Um, with the opening of the first Commonwealth Parliament in Melbourne, uh, after Federation in 1901, he became a foundation member of the Federal Press Gallery and reported every sitting of Parliament for the next 27 years before the Parliament moved to Canberra. This is a great achievement, unlikely to be, um, to be bettered. Mr Smith helped found the Australian Journalists Association in 1910, which of course has morphed into um, the bigger union, the MEAA, and he served as both the AJA's President and General Secretary. After his death in 1935, his family asked the University of Melbourne, uh, Melbourne's Council for approval to endow an annual lecture in his name. The first lecture was given the following year by Sir Edward Cunningham, who was an old editor of the Argus. They used to knight editors back then. Uh, over the subsequent 70-plus uh, years, lecturers have included Rupert Murdoch, Mary Delahunty, Michelle Grattan, John Fain, Paul Kelly, Kim Beasley, and Maxine McHugh. I had the honour of delivering the lecture last year. Uh, I want to thank the Smith family on behalf of the university for their continuing support of this very important lecture. Now to tonight's lecturer. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Squat. Mark Squat. Mark Squat. <laughs> that, was, that was not a Freudian slip. Um, the managing director of, and editor-in-chief of the ABC. Well, look, um, thank you, Michael, for the uh, kind welcome. And I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to be here with, uh, with a number of other uh, people who have delivered the A.N. Smith uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, Michael himself, John Fain, uh, Paul Chadwick, uh, Eric Beecher. Uh, Rupert Murdoch's not here tonight. Um, and, and, and perhaps I think it's even fair to say he's not even here in spirit tonight. <laughs> but Rupert is never far from our thoughts, as we will see. It took Edward Gibbon nearly 20 years and six volumes to map the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. W. H. Jordan, in his evocative poem, The Fall of Rome, condensed the experience to just 28 lines. Tonight, as I discuss the tremors of change and the shifting ground beneath our media empires, you'll be glad to hear that I've taken Auden as my text, although I cannot quite model his economy. And by the end, you might think I've been more like Gibbon. But Auden's poem is wonderful. Fragments, voices, images, a mosaic of decline. Greatness disappearing piece by piece as a new world emerges. And the poem makes the point, of course, that there's no one reason why empires fail. Why those forces that seem to generate such success, such wealth, such dominance, seem to lose their potency and impact. Why the points on the compass suddenly shift and that which once made us great becomes instead the source of our demise. Auden brilliantly depicts the forces of change gathering in the distance. 
All together, elsewhere vast, herds of reindeer move across, miles and miles of golden moss, silently and very fast. Tonight I want to talk about media empires. They have been giants in our lives. And in these early days of a new millennium, shock waves are being felt all around them. They now seem less like agents of their destinies than helpless witnesses to the unravelling of, of what they all once stood for. These have turned out to be desperate days. Some will fail, others will renew and endure. So let's look at some of these things within empires that have changed. Let's look at the stresses the new forces are bringing. Let's look at the behaviours of the media Caesars under this pressure. And let's think about what might happen now. We have reached a point we should perhaps have seen coming, yet largely we did not. And nothing has prepared us for it. Many who were once visionary media leaders failed at the time of their great success to see the reality of the business, the inherent weakness, to see how real the risks were, the emerging threats. Today they seem largely out of solutions and instead challenge reality by seeking to deny a revolution that's already taking place, by attempting to use a power that no longer exists, by trying to impose on the world a law that is impossible to enforce. We will surely look back on the 19th and 20th century and say that media was a great business to be in. Audiences hungry for news and entertainment. Powerful media organisations with deep pockets fighting hard to keep competitors out and profits in. A steady rationalisation and with competitors being either swallowed up or steamrolled, those who survived never had it so good. The names are legendary. The Hearsts and the Grahams and the States, Beaverbrook and Rothermere in Britain, the Murdochs and Packers here. Even the fictional names were legendary. Citizen Kane. For staff working in media organisations, the proprietors were often people they learned to hate. Always wealthy, often remote and cavalier, occasionally cruel, brutal and hard-hearted. They had money, yes, but they also had the power of belief. They believed in the product, its importance, its influence. They were competitive and they'd back themselves in a fight, spend money now to make money later. They were after a reward beyond money. They wanted the influence and the power that came with the ownership of a media empire. So when people remember the barons, they remember them with a respect for the passion and love they had for the product. Murdoch arriving in a newsroom with a bundle of papers under his arms, sleeves rolled up, critiquing edition after edition in front of a tremulous editor. Packer barking down the phone to some, pro to some programmer about last night's numbers. The Fairfaxes letting the editors spend what it took so they could cover the stories as they needed. There are fewer barons now. Fewer individuals who can make bold and at times financially irrational calls to spend, to expand, to grow, to wait, to be patient. Now the metrics are simpler. Shareholder value, ROI, and most owners are not barons. They are funds, they are investors, they are banks, and they are rational in terms of the returns they require. It's just a business like any other business. It could just as easily be a shoe store or a grocery. For the barons, it was more than a business. It was a life and a passion. And many would try and protect most that which they loved. And today, when that protection is most needed, most of the barons have gone. The Packers have largely sold out of traditional media. The Bancrofts took the cash. The Salzburgers lost most of theirs. The Fairfaxes own less than 10%. Tony Riley's in trouble. Conrad Black is in jail. <laughs> and Rupert? Well, Rupert is in a category all of his own. 
We'd better come back to Rupert later on. There is an argument that this old proprietorial model, long run by media barons, operated as a form of protection from harsh realities the businesses may have otherwise faced. They were still vastly profitable. Some Australian newspapers and television networks ran on margins that were the envy of the rest of the world. But the key business success, particularly in open markets, is not about how much money you're making today or have made in the past. It is about how much money you will make. What is your growth story? Well, a growth story now for traditional media, that's getting harder and harder to find. But when you look back on it, some fundamental weaknesses in the traditional publishing and broadcasting model were evident long before the internet revolution. The Barons worked on a ver variation of the J. Paul Getty formula for success. Rise early, work hard, strike oil. TV, radio and newspapers were their oil. But only the most naive or indifferent to reality could have failed to see the ominous signs a long time ago, in the days when Google was an inconceivable number, when Yahoo signalled uncouthness, when Twittering was something teachers told their children to stop. The free-to-air television networks used their muscle to keep further licences restrained, manipulating the market, prevailing over politicians, keeping competitors out which is why a quarter of a century speculation about a fourth commercial television licence came to exactly nothing. And who'd want it now? Media policy amounted to not much more than a tawdry cast of compromises designed to appease these moguls. The restraining power of free-to-air television moguls explains to the glacial embrace of pay television in Australia, finally arriving here 20 years after the United States. Even without the internet, it was inevitable that one day commercial television would face significant competition for audiences and advertisers. That the oligopoly would break down, taking audiences and therefore advertisers and therefore revenues away. Taking away the growth story that had maintained and sustained the corporations. There used to be far more newspapers in print. They closed, they merged, they disappeared. Television killed the afternoon newspapers, the weekend newspapers killed the quality weeklies and the news magazines. I've heard it said that no editor of any of these publications that closed thought, as the end neared, that there was anything wrong with the product. But the long run trend showed fewer people wanted to read a paper every day. Young people read less than older people. And no matter what magic a particular editor might possess, Reverses to circulation decline were sporadic and ephemeral and more often purchased with massive discounting, ghost readers and giveaways. On the reverse side, at the broadsheets, the classifieds funded the newsrooms. And again, even before online, the signs were there of efforts to loosen the iron grip metropolitan papers had on bringing together buyers and sellers. Suburban newspapers ate a chunk of real estate revenue their much more attractive glossy colour newsprint had it all over the dull lineage ads. And there was also evidence that some people only wanted the classifieds and weren't interested in the rest of the paper, giving rise to publications like the Trading Post that took away profits for a time until now when the Times will take it also away. The response was for bigger newspapers, more inserts, more magazines to grow opportunities for display advertisers. But sometimes, these seem to be more for the advertisers' interests than the readers. These pressures were evident when only a handful of people could print or broadcast to reach an audience of scale. But now anyone can instantly publish on the web. And as long as they have content that people want to see and read, they can reach millions. The extent of the revolution could not have been seen the extent of the transformation, the way it shifted power to audiences, the power to choose what they would see and read from where and when. In strategy, technology companies continually outclassed the content companies. They were always ahead of the game. And you can see now how few of these media companies were nimble enough 
or quick enough in response, how they struggled to try and work out just what was going on here. I suspect that the law about technological change, that the impact of most change is overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term, may prove to have never been more true than in the case of the internet revolution. It's interesting to observe the differing reactions of various media empires to the emerging online world. Some companies found growth in diversification from the sector. As the New York Times was investing more in newsprint, notably by buying the Boston Globe and taking control of the International Herald Tribune, the Washington Post company took another tack. It sought leverage out of its earlier purchase of Kaplan, an educational testing company. Kaplan now sustains the Post and represents more than half the earnings of the Washington Post company. The iconic masthead itself lost more than $130 million in the last half year. But the growth of the company has been sustained by Kaplan, and now the Washington Post Company has a market capitalization four times that of the New York Times Company. In the midst of the storm, it's easy to take pot shots at failed strategies of the past. The Times purchase of the Globe being a billion dollar bungle. Fairfax's failure to buy Seek, not that it was ever really on offer. The exuberant overspend of dot coms before the late 90s bust and the underspending after the bust. The inability to find any major traditional media organisation that you could confidently say has got it right in this world of fragmenting content and audiences. And it would be wonderful tonight to be able to come here and to present you with some blinding insight that everyone else has missed, a pathway through to a more vibrant future for old media organisations and the new. But I don't have it, and I've read of no one who does. And for newspapers, the last great hope now seems to be something called waiting for Rupert. It's hard to see in an English-speaking environment anyway the companies that have cut a path to a genuine transformation of the future, leveraging off the back of great brands, big audiences and bigger profits so they might secure a place in the new world. It's certainly hard to see any that did so without diversifying aggressively out of the core business, which made them their money and their name. To find new streams of income, different stories for advertisers and a growth story for investors. And now, new vast herds seem to be on the move. Mathematicians founding Google, a student inventing Facebook, and last generation's new money, the Microsoft and the Yahoo's, determined to spend all they can to stay in the game. And you never know where the next challenge is going to come from. Silently and very fast, the next Twitter, the next Facebook is being invented to attract and entrance audiences to steal time, to steal advertising dollars, to steal more of the growth, to steal the future from traditional media. Everywhere now the scramble is on to win in online, to give the audiences what they want when they want it. But it is hard in traditional media when there is still so much left to lose. When you've spent so much to getting where you are and you have those presses and those trucks, the cost of your television licence, your broadcasting systems. When newspaper advertising still brings in ten times what the advertising online does when audiences watching your catch-up services are far less valuable than those watching television when you broadcast there. When you have been so powerful and dominant for so long, it is hard to believe that empire is slipping away. You want to believe that you'll see the green shoots of recovery, that the good times will come back once the advertisers start spending again. These surviving media giants, successful and profitable for decades, are used to shaping their audiences and shaping their worlds. The habit of command is hard to break. And any deference to audience power seems acquired only when all the other possibilities have been exhausted. And the latest example is the push by the newspaper proprietors, led by Murdoch, to get people to pay for their content online. After nearly 15 years, when the vast majority of online news and information has been free. When Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal, he indicated he would look to drop the paper's paid website. 
But now, in the saddle, he looks to transplant that paid content model to all his newspapers. And he's keen for all other newspapers to fall into line. And as his son James said recently in the UK, those pesky public broadcasters who should seek to provide quality content to the public for free, who want to do that, they should be pulled into line. The Murdoch push is fascinating. You sense this rage at the injustice of what the online world is doing to his traditional print business model. Murdoch has always been willing to cross-subsidise his print passions. Papers like the Times of London, the New York Post and the Australian endured years of losses and survived because he said so. And because he had the Simpsons there to help soak up the red ink. And ironically, given his current plans, one of his strategies was always to cut the price of content to cheap and often uneconomic levels to put his competitors under the gun. But now the man who just four years ago said that he wanted to make the necessary cultural changes to meet the new demands of the digital native says he's not going to respond to the demands of those digital natives. Instead, they who have never paid in their lives for news online will be asked to respond instead to his demands and start paying. The argument seems to be that people once didn't pay to watch television, but many now do. We fought against time local phone calls and now we make them every day on our mobile phones. Some of us now might, through iTunes, pay for recorded music that we once downloaded illegally. And he believes that because we want to read and see this great content through his newspapers so badly online, now we will pay for that. It strikes me as a classic play of old empire, of empire in decline. Believing that because you once controlled the world, you can continue to do so. Because you once set the rules, you can do so again. Acting on the assumption that you still have the power that befits the emperor. And whilst it is always dangerous to underestimate Murdoch, the assumptions that underpin the Murdoch plan seem to me wistful and perhaps wishful. Some mastheads, like the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, will have pricing power. They have distinctive content. That content, appropriately used, is more than entertaining and informative. It can be financially valuable. And beyond that, there will be other brands, the New York Times, The Economist, the Washington Post, who provide reporting so distinctive, so comprehensive, so authoritative, that they may also have pricing power online. But what about the rest? What do they have to offer online? Major events have never been reported more widely, from news reports to commentary, analysis, chat rooms. Photo and video has become ubiquitous. When a newspaper breaks a story, it becomes news and everybody reports it. Unless everyone, everywhere, decides to charge, there will be so much content that's available free. The pricing power comes from being an exclusive provider of services people feel they badly want. The convenience and utility of the mobile phone allowed providers to set a price for these services. And whilst there are differences in prices and offerings, no one is offering mobile services for free. Exclusive content on pay TV has been the main driver of audience take up there. And despite the massive piracy levels for recorded music, iTunes has demonstrated again the public is willing to pay for a service that appears to be relatively cheap, of high quality and of enduring value. A song on iTunes costs little and lasts forever and is built on the back of micropayments for artist royalties. But when you want to charge customers for something that in this era is effectively generic, that has many different free substitutes and is by its nature ephemeral, mainly used and discarded, then the challenges you face are formidable. And antitrust laws lie in wait for a deal to be struck between newspaper organisations around a collective approach to this. In any event, game theory would suggest the incentive for other newspapers will be, finally, not to charge. To lock up content will be to dry up traffic. 
To be a substitute that offers that content for free will drive traffic up and assist in the pricing power in setting advertising rates. You can almost hear the other proprietors urging Mur Murdoch on, assuring him that they are right behind him. And they are pushing him through that paywall as they then scurry away to make as much as they can for as long as they can outside the paywall to be free to pick up the traffic that flees the sites that now want payment for access. There will be sites that have free and premium content, as there are today. But I suspect too much attention is being given to finding a pay model rather than addressing the content questions in terms of quality and distinctiveness that will really drive audience commitment in the long term. There will be newspapers that largely get out of online altogether who try and hold their print franchise for as long as they can and it might work for a regional paper for a time but it denies the reality for those who can make the investment in content without the overheads of printing and distribution. Much of the content, most of it, nearly all of it when you look at the totality of the web will continue to be free. It certainly will be free at the ABC. We won't run the most comprehensive news operation in the country with more reporters locally, nationally and internationally than anyone else. We report the news, break news and provide space for analysis and commentary. The public pays for the ABC to deliver distinctive content to them. And, and if it is content we are creating and packaging for them now, they are entitled to view that content free of charge. We are restructuring our entire operations around our ability to deliver on that commitment. Redesigning the way our newsrooms operate, creating new services like Continuous News Online and our internet television service iView. And as our content is paid for by the public, and as the public currently pays for the distribution of our content through terrestrial broadcasts, we will be fighting for that content to be continued to be access free, including through the National Broadband Network. Today at the ABC we, place, we face plenty of challenges. And in a way we are a media giant of our own and face very real demands in this new environment. Like how a public broadcaster created in an era of media scarcity survives in an era of media plenty. How to be heard amidst all the clutter. And we also face the challenge of standing up to critics who, in the face of their own competitive pressure, will turn against the public broadcaster, attacking our content, attacking our funding, attacking our right to exist. The Murdoch speech in the UK attacking the BBC in recent weeks sets up the arguments we can expect to emerge here, rolled out by the usual suspects. The ABC faces the challenges all publishers and broadcasters face to not just be an oracle, espousing the facts and analysis as we see it, but creating space for our audiences to speak, to share their knowledge and insights, their creativity and ingenuity, to embed a user-generated content experience at the same time as holding on to our brand, our values, our integrity. We recognise that younger audiences with so much more media choice than their parents or grandparents lack brand loyalty. They will simply pursue the information and entertainment they want from wherever they can get it, whenever they can get it. And further to user-generated content, many young people every day are creating and sharing media, simply through social media and uh, sharing videos, through to far more elaborate and complex creations. The key to all this is content, of course. Do you have what people want to see, read and hear? And then will they want to talk about it, share it with others, respond to it positively or negatively, engage with it, and can they experience the content where they are? At the ABC, it really doesn't matter to us how people experience the content we create or curate. What matters to us is that we are putting this compelling content into the media mix that people find engaging, compelling, unique, distinctive, and that we make sure that there are no barriers to them seeing it. Part of this transformation internally is a view about our online content. 
Unlike other media organisations, we don't need to bring audiences back to our homepage so we can sell traffic to advertisers to get the clicks to monetize. More than 8 million Australians are now spending more and more time each month on Facebook. And at the ABC, we're creating new widgets so people can take the ABC content they like, content they help paid for, and allow them to share it through their own social networks. Our audience will become our distributors. In terms of media history again, it is revolutionary not to be using all your efforts to bring your audiences to your papers, to your radio stations, to your television network. It is more a model like the music industry, where you give your work to others and they can take it and experience it as often as they like, wherever they like. At the ABC at times we're gripped by a fear that we will not have done enough, that we will not have been nimble, that we will have been too protective and defensive, that we will not have been fast enough or bold enough to meet the challenges of the times. So we are re-engineering our newsrooms to deliver quality news when our audience wants it, not just when we schedule it. Turning our local radio stations into media hubs full of content generated for broadband, user-generated content, being a community town square. Internally, we're declaring war on silos and insulated thinking. Being audience, not organisationally centred. It affects the way we organise ourselves, the way we work together and cooperate, the way we partner with others, the way we cede some space, some control to our audiences to remain relevant and compelling. If we are to survive as any more than a shell, a legacy broadcaster, an empire in decline ourselves, this is what we must do. It is easy to lose sight of the fact as we wrestle through this transformation that we're hardly the first industry to face such challenges and to undergo such change. Hardly the first set of organisations to face a reality that our old ways of thinking will not get us to the future. Einstein said that problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. So we will need to find new ways of thinking. Take IBM, whose CEO in the 1950s, Thomas Watson, was said to have predicted that the world would only ever need five computers. Yet IBM became the company that delivered the computer revolution. And IBM CEO in the 1990s, Lou Gerstner, took the company out of the mainframe business, overruled plans to break it up, embraced the opportunities of the internet, and turned the company once more again into something different, this time into an IT services business. For those now in media empires, for those who want to survive, endure, be part of the future, there's little time to be wistful. There's little time to be angry about how things have worked out. They were great days, but they have gone. Certainly there are things that greatly concern us. Is there a business model for newspapers? How will Australian stories be told in a global content uh, era? How will we share as a community if there's no shared media of ex experience? Where will our commons be? And certainly we see ourselves at the ABC play an important role in meeting some of these needs. But we all know for sure that there is a greater thirst for knowledge, for insight, for entertainment, for engagement, for viewing and sharing media today than at any other time in history. Never has the audience been bigger. Never has news travelled faster and been more accessible in more places more quickly. Never has a news story, a big news story, reached larger audiences in more ways. Ways of telling stories, making them immediate and compelling and alive, has never been more vibrant. The opportunity to connect and engage has never been more exciting. Gibbon reminds us that Rome didn't fall in a day. For some media organisations, there may be too many overwhelming forces to stave off the inevitable. But for now, for those of us in the media and those who lead the media, there is an understanding that until that day comes, our destiny is in our hands to take advantage of all that's before us. So with so much we don't know, is there anything we do? 
Can we make any informed guesses about the characteristics and capabilities of those organisations most likely to find renewal, to reinvent, to sustain, to rebuild for the years ahead? And you have a right to be asking by now, am I offering any solutions? There are a few certainties, but one thing is certain, that no solutions will be found through legacy thinking. So let me now make a number of hesitant suggestions. Number one, the only media organisations that will survive will be those who know and accept that all the rules have changed. That the media business has gone from being one of the most simple to one of the most complex. Only those who can now see what many generals appreciate only after a devastating loss, that the tactics that won them the last battle might just be the ones that deliver them defeat in the next. Survivors will be those who face up to how the world is, not how they want the world to be, and who are determined to secure a future in that new media world, not just squeeze out a few more years' profits, just milk the business to the CEO's retirement and the board moves on. It's transformational thinking, and only transformational thinking, that will bring a true critical analysis of the business model. Like whether you should own printing presses, whether you should print every day, whether you should move to a totally on-demand market, whether your hero brand is your online brand. And even if you're not able to make these moves today, it will get you thinking about being ready to move into that space in the future. At the ABC, we are thinking about a world of 10,000 channels that you can see on your television set, not the five that we grew up with delivered into our living room. And we're trying to think about what that means for television and what tonight's television schedule means when at the touch of a button on your remote control or your mobile, you can watch any program that we've aired in the last two weeks on your television set. More than that, we're asking what is television? What is radio in this era of global on-demand content? And in doing so, we're asking questions that, that address nothing less than the very foundations on which the ABC has been built over the course of 77 years. You have to be ready to be truly bold. We were successful in persuading government to get behind our efforts to create more Australian drama, yet at the same time we're looking at future forms of narrative, with initiatives in games whose stories appeal so powerfully to the generations coming through. Why? because we want the ABC to be part of their lives, just as it was for their parents and grandparents. The second thing I think we know is that successful organisations will be endlessly inquisitive about the new, understanding that no one knows where the next breakthrough idea or technology will come from. You don't just need to find creative partners, you need to let them do what they do, not just purchase them and crush them, as many leading media organisations do, but give them space in strategic alliances to inform you, to help build your understanding, to help you find new audiences in new ways. To seek and be excited about finding and working with people who might turn your organisation upside down. To sit in meetings with people half your age. And to listen. And to act. And those new partnerships may involve more than technological hookups. It might be around fundamental things such as consortiums of newspapers and broadcasters and non-profits working together to create a critical mass required for real investigative journalism, a model that's emerging in the United States, to be part of something rather than owning everything. And it can mean a different approach to innovation, and I admit that this is easier as a public broadcaster. Being willing to innovate and take risks so that we can produce a social benefit through the ABC is a responsibility that comes with not having to produce a financial profit. We invest not because there'll be a profit there, but because an audience might be there someday. And that is why, unapologetically, we've embraced Twitter, uncertain if it's a revolution or a fad, particularly since the gap between the hype and the has-been has never been so narrow. Yet Twitter might just be where our future audiences and communities may choose to spend their media time. And we need to be there with our audiences. 
The third thing I think we can confidently say is successful organisations will be willing to empower their audiences to contribute, to create, to share media. These organisations will cede power to gain engagement and respect. They will be willing to let other voices be heard. They will learn how to protect brand integrity whilst entrusting their brand to others. To a degree, everyone is doing this. But the greatest success will come when an audience long treated with an oligopolist disdain is treated with real respect and the contribution is seen as a valued contribution. The simple fact is that young audiences, the future of every media organisation including the ABC, have the tools and now the experience and the expectation to create and share media. They do it with their friends, they want to do it with us, it is how they connect and belong. And the media organisation that doesn't make audience contribution a central part of their strategy fades to black. We recognised immediately that by mixing content that comes from within the ABC with content from without, the Pro-Am model, we end up with the most powerful content possible. And we're still working on getting the balance right. Yet it's only by maintaining a strong editorial role that will reinforce and not undermine the ABC brand. Even Wikipedia's Jimmy Wales acknowledges that the secret is in the edit, which might explain why an aggregating site, which has acquired such a huge community of users, the Huffington Post, lists 62 editors and just four reporters on their site. We'd suit for a different ratio ourselves. But we have to come to terms with the undeniable fact that for the scoop on many news events, we cannot hope to compete with the audience. We need to team up with them. They have the time, the opportunity, and particularly now with that powerful instant publishing double act, Twitter and TwitPeak, they have the numbers. Briefly, number four, part of the protection of media assets will come through diversification, as has been the case with news in the Washington Post. Commercial media who found themselves long in assets greatly threatened by this revolution, like newsprint and free-to-air television, with no other growth story, will remain greatly challenged. And finally, number five. The great challenge on all of this is to start within, on areas within your organisation of cultures and behaviours, recognising that your own old internal fiefdoms come from another world. I'm constantly struck by conversations with people across a range of media organisations who would testify that despite all the revolution taking place in the media world, the old line is true. We have seen the enemy and it is us. That in our organisations, if only we could agree on a strategy that was widely understood and stick with it. And if only we worked together, putting all the old internal battles and turf wars behind us, we would give ourselves a far better chance. At the ABC, we are constantly at work on this thinking through what it means to be a public broadcaster in a digital age, working out what it means to reach more Australians in more ways more often, to enrich every Australian's life, to be the town square. And we are committed to learning how to work with each other, to respect each other, to learn from each other. It has generated some comment, some cynicism, cynicism. but finally I think the establishment of key organisational values at the ABC Integrity, respect, collegiality, innovation has helped us think about how we need to work together to deliver our future. The ABC is currently 77 years old. I expect we will see 100. And when we see 100, I suspect historians will look back on these years, these closing years of the decade and say, this was the time the media world shook, where business models failed, where technology empowered and when new opportunities erupted, where new futures emerged through all the despair, all the loss, all the uncertainty. I fear I've ended up taking as long as given. So let me conclude here with a line I often use at the ABC. The words of John Shah, who said, the future's not a place we're going, it's a place we're making. And the paths to the future are made, not found. And the process of making them changes both us and our final destination. 
Despite all that's happening to them, despite all that's happening now, the fate of our organisations lies with us, our strategic insight, how we work together, our courage, our boldness, our imagination. The fate of our organisations, our industry, our future, will be determined finally by us. Thank you very much. My name is Ingrid Volkmer. I'm the acting head of the Media and Communications Program here at the University of Melbourne in the School of Culture and Communication. And I've been asked to moderate the question and answer session. Um, we have only 10 minutes. So um, may I just invite you to raise your hand. And we have, I think, people here coming with microphones. So you will be audible. There's somebody in the back. Yeah. You spoke about re-engineering your newsrooms, yeah. and you also spoke about um, incorporating user-generated content with internally produced content. Mm. Can you just talk a bit about how this has impacted your news coverage? Like, um, just how much is ABC's news coverage, um, how much of it is influenced by user-generated content and social media? Yeah, I, I think... Um, I used to find when I was a newspaper editor, you'd pull together the news list of the day, the stories you'd want to work on, but you knew that actually your reporters probably knew more about the stories than you do, but the audience really knew what was going on. And actually the process was trying to find out from those out there, you know, what was really happening. And I think we have numerous examples of, of how the audience now with the tools to text in, to send photographs in, to send news in, provides a rich reservoir of, of material. Some of the user-generated content from the February bushfires is astounding. And our new Black Saturday site, abc.net.au slash Black Saturday, is a remarkable collection of content that our journalists have created side by side with the content that our audience captured for us, where they were in the midst of it all. When the dust storm uh, descended on Sydney a few weeks ago, the photographs were astounding that our audiences contributed. And, and mixed with our ability to edit, our ability to curate that content, it's a far richer audience experience than anything that our journalists could have done on their own. I think the re-engineering of the newsroom is a complex thing. The, the, the social contract used to be, the news is on at 7 o'clock. Get home at 7, we'll give you the news. If you're not home at 7, don't complain to us, just get home on time tomorrow night and catch up as best you can. Now our audience has an expectation that they will get the very best ABC news available uh, at the moment they want it, not at the moment that it's convenient for us. And we had many a great story that had been completed and ready to show for hours before we could show it, waiting for the clock to turn seven. And so now there's an expectation that we are able to deliver that content online, we certainly do it on radio. Increasingly, we're doing it on television at a time the audience wants. And yes, that's a change in our news process is quite significant, uh, but work that's well underway. All right, we have, I think, time for two more questions. There's one here, and then there's another one over there. How do you see the future of the ABC in Asia, for example, through the Australian network? Yeah. Channel? Uh, well, yeah. Is there any uh, the ABC has been an international broadcast for 70 years. And that, in the main, has been through Radio Australia, which continues uh, with great strength and has done vital work in the region during the natural disasters in recent days. And in more recent years, Australia Network that broadcasts into 44 countries, reaching audiences of millions every week. Uh, we deliver that Australia Network service under contract to uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, that contract comes up from new renewal from time to time. And we'll be making a strong case to the government that the ABC is by far the best equipped broadcaster to deliver international broadcasting. If you look around the world, the G20 countries are dramatically expanding their level of international broadcasting as a soft diplomatic arm. And normally, uh, in the vast majority of cases, it's the public broadcaster that's delivering that. And so we are keen to expand our footprint. I've spent a lot of time in China trying to get landing rights so we can show Australian network in China. We're growing significantly in India and we have significant plans to expand that service uh, if the funding is available. Thank you for your wonderful address, Mr. Scott. Um, Sirs, so it's print media that is so threatened, as I understand, 
and not uh, electronic at this stage. It's print media that's so, uh, so threatened. My, uh, my, my news agent tells me that the Women's Weekly is collapsing by 1% a month circulation mm -hmm. and newspapers certainly seem to be falling. Thank yeah, you. I think uh, a lot of attention has been around print, but by, by no means is all a challenge in print. Uh, I think uh, you know, regional radio is really struggling now and will struggle more as fast broadband uh, hits those communities. Um, Free-to-air broadcasters are being hit significantly as the, as the size of the audience shrinks because they have more choices through pay television or time being spent uh, online. And so I think all traditional media outlets are being hit because the business model that sustained them, and the business model was basically that very few people could print, very few people could broadcast so they could charge big prices for advertisers to attract those audiences. But now as many people can publish, many people can broadcast, the traditional business models are being broken down. And whilst there's a lot of focus on print and can newspapers survive, I think it is all traditional media that is undergoing this revolution. Okay, that's the end of the question and answer session. For those of you um, who have more questions, um, there will be a streamed uh, content or streamed lecture. This lecture is being streamed, as you see, and that will be available. That content will be available on the university's website tomorrow. I'm not so sure if there is like a discussion forum as well. I don't think we have that yet, but that might be something, you know, for the next lecture, so that people can then still um, debating about these important issues. Thank you very much.